Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. It's the international break. It's great fun, isn't it? But we'll get through it. We will. And we have the promise of a North London derby at the end of it, so that'll be fun. They are always great fun at the Emirates, aren't they? But anyway, today's video. What I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do a bit of Tottenham Hotspur housekeeping, as it were, uh, to begin with, and then I'm going to launch into a Q&A. You've asked loads and loads and loads of questions, so I'm probably going to do another Q&A, maybe even another two, uh, because there's been so many questions, and um, I'll ask for more at the end as well, just to, to keep the variety going. Um, so what I'm going to start with, just um, kind of did a piece in the week, and it's fleshing it out in my mind. Fabio Paratici has been working behind the scenes to... Um, form his his own backroom staff, I guess, as it were. Um, various kind of... If you weren't aware, I think I probably said this in a previous video, way back after he arrived uh, last summer, he and the previous technical performance director, Steve Hitchin, underwent a kind of big appraisal of the whole football side of Tottenham Hotspur, um, going through scouting department, uh, sports science loads of different areas within the, everything essentially that led to the team being better on the pitch um, and they did went through lots of appraisals and decided new structures and what they were going to do then Steve Hitchin left in um, was it February this year wasn't it he resigned um, I think he's coming towards the end I think because he was on gardening leave I presume that's either finished or, or coming towards the end of that now um, but in terms of what was left behind was that Pratici was trying to fill this structure beneath him. Um, again, if you haven't heard me explain this before, Pratici's kind of skill set, as it were, he is a guy who obviously transfer market is his thing. That's where his skills lie. He's seen as one of the best in the world when it comes to having contacts across the world. Uh, I don't want to use the expression wheeling and dealing, but what else can I use? Harry Redknapp would not be happy with that. Um... And also his strengths, Paratici, are dealing with uh, the boardroom figures at various clubs and also at Tottenham as well. Uh, the clubs he's in, he's very good at being that bridge between the manager or head coach and the powers that be. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's kind of pushing through what he wants, I guess, or the coach wants to improve the team. That's something that he is, yeah, that's where his areas of expertise lie. Uh, so what he does to kind of, flesh out everything else that has to kind of fall under his remit is he builds like a tree as it were a structure of very talented people underneath him that deal with everything else the day-to-day -day running of a lot of things and they all obviously report into him um so steve hitchin obviously i know there's a very divided opinion on the man um but what he, his job remit at tottenham was quite a wide one he did quite a lot so essentially Two people in particular have been brought in to kind of take on that and, I guess, specialise in the two roles. One of them, uh, and obviously a lot of these are newly created roles as well. This is a very new system, so uh, bear with me because there's quite a bit to it. So, is number two, obviously, uh, you'll be well aware of now, is Greta Steinson. Um, his title is Performance Director. Former Bolton defender, um, was Everton's Head of Recruitment uh, during it was all a bit messy at Everton, I think, at that time as well. Uh, so he came in in July. Um, I've seen a fair bit of him around, actually. Um, he's Anyone in the stadium will have often seen him down near the touchline with Paratici whenever there's warm-ups. He's often down there. I've also seen him at academy games as well, and I saw him on the tour, the game in Israel against Roma. He was not only behind the dugouts, but I saw him around the hotel quite a bit. Um, he's introduced himself, said hello, very nice chap. Um, so, yeah, hopefully he is now pushing on. I'm sure he is with his job and uh, essentially, yeah, being the eyes and ears and number two for Paratici. Um, then on August the 1st, kind of the second part of that um, attacking duo, I don't know how we're going to say that, um, is Andy Scolding. Andy Scalding uh, has come in from Rangers, where he was head of scouting for four years. His role, I understand, is head of football strategy at Tottenham. So, yeah, he kind of links in with Greta Steinson. Um, and he's been at, uh, where was he? He's, he's London-born, he's London although he's um, 
been at Rangers for four years. He's worked with the FA, worked with Olympiacos, Valencia, Salford City. Um, quite a diverse uh, range there. But yeah, at Rangers, very, very highly rated. And from what I understand, he's 40 years old. From what I understand, he's made a very good impression at Tottenham so far. He's only been there, like I say, August the 1st. So what are we at now? Almost pushing the two months. Yeah, a lot of people saying good things about him. Um, and he's kind of made an impression already. Um, he and um, Steinson as well. Right, so that's two people essentially covering Hitchens' job, I guess, in more, yeah, more specialising into it, I guess, rather than one person trying to do all of that, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't I wasn't there when I decided um, how the new structure was going to look and, and the differences to last um, one. So then there's a chief scout. That's another role, which previously, I'm trying to remember, I think Hitchin way back was a chief scout and then became like a director of football of sorts and then became that technical performance director role. So now they have a chief scout, um, Leonardo Gabinini. Um, he started work this summer at the club. Um, he is formerly of Watford and Udinese. Udinese. Um, if you're not aware, Watford and Udinese are kind of linked. I think is it the Pozzo family? Um, so essentially... You're working for one, you're working for the other. So he worked for them and Spurs snapped him up. Well, Paratic, he did. Obviously, one of his compatriots um, snapped him up this summer. So that's a very already the top of the tree underneath Paratic is three brand new people with no previous association with Tottenham Hotspur whatsoever. So that's first team. But then they also were making um, changes at academy level as well. So you've got uh, Simon Davies, not the Simon Davies who used to play for Tottenham. Um, he was a former Wales international. I think he only maybe got one cap, though, unlike Tottenham Simon Davies, who got a fair bit more than that. Um, he's former Man City head of academy coaching. Um, and he worked at Anderlecht as well with Vincent Company as one of his senior coaches, uh, first team coaches. So... I want to get this right. Simon Davies has come in with the title of Head of Coaching Methodology. Uh, from what I understand, that role is to kind of bridge the gap between first team and the academy and work essentially with academy manager Dean Rastrick and just, yeah, I guess, just making it all sync up. I suppose a lot of clubs will look at the likes of, I suppose, Ajax are a great example of... I hate to use the jargon, but a synergy between the first team and the academy and having it makes the progression from academy to first team easier, I guess, if everyone is playing in a certain way, has a similar ethos and and yeah, so that he's gonna help that. Um then on top of that, there's a new emerging talent scouts were appointed, a few of those. Uh one of those I know is a good chap called Chris Scudder who worked at West Ham, Derby, Brentford and Leeds before Spurs uh, brought him in, I think, in July. Uh, so those are, as the name suggests, emerging talent scouts who, um, yeah, they, well, good example. They were heavily involved in the signing in the summer of the Sheffield United 17-year-old striker, Will uh, Lankshire, who uh, came in just towards the end of the wind. I think there's reports it was around £2 million. Um, Highly rated kid. Um, and yeah, apparently these news emergent ta emerging talent scouts really push this signing. So remember that if he's a big star and becomes a big, big name for Spurs or anywhere, um, it came because of those emerging talent scouts, including Chris Scudder, were um, the ones that kind of scouted and pushed that one through. Um, coaching, we know there's a couple of coaching changes in the academy with Yaya Toure coming in uh, as the new um, under 16s coach, and obviously Jermaine Defoe as well. His is a more a broader role, I guess, gaining experience working um, as a coach across the under-17 to under-21 age categories as well. Um, and then I understand about two to three weeks ago, Jeff Vettere, I'm not sure, entirely sure how you pronounce it, V-E-T-E-R-E, -E -E, Jeff Vettere, Vettere, um, 56-year-old, he came in in a role that is essentially it's scouting internationally for the development squad. Uh, the end development squad is the under 21s so essentially looking for the best um i suppose young kids that can just come into that next category because spurs do have a little bit of a a gap there they've got the first team and you've got your kind of some really talented youngsters like alfie divine dane scarlet the likes of that but actually those who are sticking around and playing in the academy in the development squad 
it's a little bit of a gap because a lot of those players who are good at that age are kind of going off on loan. Um, like, I guess, Troy Parrott is a great example of that as well. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I saw in Johnson's, um, what's it called now, Papa John's Trophy last night, Harvey White, who's technically a first-team member, was having to go back and play in that game uh, just to kind of give them a little bit of, I suppose, experience in there for that match, which I think they lost 3-0 at Peterborough. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, there's clearly a gap there. And Jeff uh, Vitera, Vitera, so I'm so sorry. If you, not that he's ever going to watch this, but apologies for probably butchering his name. He's had a really kind of interesting CV. He's um, <laughs> technically that the one that leaps out of you is he was a scout at Real Madrid for a short time. I must stress, I think it was only about six months or so. Um, but he's also been at uh, Newcastle. He went from there, later became a chief scout at Aston Villa, then a spell as a technical director at Charlton, then a sporting director at Birmingham. Um, Birmingham fans don't have the... Well, only going off a few that got in touch on social media. It seems to be Birmingham fans are not a big fan of him. Uh, but what I would say, obviously, in this role, it's not a director of football role. It is purely a scouting young talent role. So... Definitely a guy with lots of experience. Quite interestingly, he hasn't been in the game since 2018. When he left Birmingham, whether it just wasn't a great experience, I don't know how it all ended, but he hasn't been in the game for a while. Um, and clearly Spurs have kind of brought him back. And this is going to sound really, um, not immature, but gamery. Um, I always remember playing football manager back in the day and signing him as a scout. I do. Which is so really weird that I'm now reporting on the guy. Uh, working for Tottenham. So, yeah, so that's the structure. That's all of that. Um, yeah, hopefully quite a bit of detail in there um, with all the various people. Um, and that's it. And there will be more in there. There will be more names and stuff as well among those emerging scouts and the scouting department. Because I remember seeing um, there's various websites where Premier League clubs will advertise for their job roles and there were lots of scouting roles up on there. Um, so... Yeah, I understand that when Pratichi kind of launched the review, he essentially got bigger budgets. They wanted a bit; they got a bigger budget for the scouting department to kind of bring it more in line with the likes of Juventus, where he'd worked before. Apparently, yeah, the Spurs one kind of wasn't quite in line with some of the top top clubs, uh, and that was something Pratichi sought to change. So, yeah, there you go. It's about what was that, seven, eight different names now in there. Um, be intrigued to see how it goes because. There's a lot of people there. There's a, a lot of people doing a lot of jobs that maybe there's a bit of crossover uh, that obviously could bring, I don't want to say clashes, but it's certainly going to be interesting to see how they all work together. All these people that don't really know each other. Oh, I'm sure they know of each other, but look, I don't think many of them will have worked together. Um, but certainly, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that now impacts future transfer windows. Uh, with Steinson and Scolding with the first team. I think Andy Scolding will also... I think And Steinson, to a degree, will both also be kind of, I suppose, keeping an eye on the academy stuff as well and any young players they know. They'll, they'll hopefully work as a team. Um, but, yeah, it'll be interesting to see the first team, how the transfer window changes slightly in future ones with them. And, obviously, also the academy intake and this under-21 band of, of players because... It's not really an area we see Spurs make a lot of transfers. I'd be interested to see whether that now changes. Um, was it Mourinho? I think Mourinho, excuse me, came in and he said something like that, that the talent, most talented young players when he was there were the likes of Dane Scarlett and Alfie Devine, who were like there in the kind of um, age-wise, but there was no one really in the middle that he could then take and supplement the first team with. Um, obviously, Harvey White is one that he and... Um, Antonio Conte have looked at, and, and obviously we know about Dane Scarlett, but and it's just interesting that there is that little void, and presumably that's what these guys are now going to um, are going to go and, and sort out. So uh, yeah, yeah, we shall uh, we shall see we shall see how that all works out. The other thing I was going to do is a very quick loan roundup. I think I said in the last one I hadn't had time to do it, so. I've got together one of those. Uh, main one, obviously, for anyone interested. Destiny Udogi, um, at Udinese. Obviously, Spurs' seventh signing of the summer. Went back there on loan for the season. He's had a cracking start to the new season. Um, two goals from his first six matches. Bear in mind, he's a 19-year-old left wing back. Two Serie A goals from his first six matches. 
Sunday, uh, just gone. He played 79 minutes in a 3-1 home win against Inter. Funnily enough, Conte's old side. And Udinese second in Serie A. Oh, they're doing very well. Um, U- Udogi is meant to, is expected to be in full inter- uh, to become a full in- Italy international this season. Um, and to be honest, Roberto Mancini's latest squad obviously didn't have him in there. Um, Andrea Sotil, the Udinese boss, was... Well, here's his quotes. These decisions surprised me. I respect Mancini's choices, but I was still surprised. I think Udogi is one of the best fullbacks in the league, and he proves this all the time. So, yeah, very exciting player I think Tottenham are going to have on their hands there. Um, so, yeah, keep an eye on that one. Um, Joe Roden. Joe Roden had a very good game for Ren. Uh, 1-1 draw at Marseille League uh, on Sunday. He... Was I was trying to think who was it? Foot Mercato voted him man of the match, um, and a few of the publications named him in their team of the weekend as well. Um, he's had a cracking time at Ren, he's really settled in now. Nine matches, scored once, also played in Europa League in midweek against uh, Fenerbahce. They drew 2 2. Some nice little quotes. He did an interview with Oost West France, I'm guessing that's West France, after the game um, on Sunday, where the quotes had written them down here. Obviously, all the guys worked hard, and so did I. The first half was good, mate. We could have, sorry, that's just about a match. You don't really need to know that. The coach gives me great, great confidence and gives me the opportunity to play a series of matches. The more you play, the more confidence you gain. I made mistakes like everyone else, but the whole team, not just me, really worked hard. Of course, the more time you spend in one place, the more comfortable you feel, but football is football no matter where. I've loved every minute spent here so far. I hope there are still many good things to come. I'm excited about what the future holds for us. So, yeah. Joe Roden really enjoying himself at Wren, which is terrific. And he's just playing regularly. As he said, that's the key, isn't it? It really is. Um, let's have a look at what else we got. Tongi. Tongi and Mbele scored his first goal for Napoli uh, in last week. Uh, Champions League against Rangers. Nice little curling shot. He struggled for minutes. He has. Um, he Obviously, the thing is, is Napoli at top of Serie A. They're playing very well. So I think they beat AC Milan 2-1 at the weekend. It's been quite difficult for him to get into that team. Um, I've written down his numbers here. 112 minutes across six appearances so far. And in both of his two starts so far for Napoli, he's been taken off at half-time. So just a case, I guess, um, you know, yeah, just a case of him now either waiting for his chance or, or trying to impress in any moments he gets. Um, Harry Winks, he's uh, yet to make his debut for Sampdoria. Um, he's arrived with an ankle injury, apparently, according to the Italian media, a media, and he hasn't appeared yet in the matchday squad. Sampdoria boss Marco Giampoli, I wrote down a quote from him. Since he arrived from Spurs, he only had one training session with us and nothing else. I hope he'll be able to come back soon. I really don't know when Harry will be available. Um, funny how he used to have ankle injuries, uh, ankle problems back in the past. I remember asking Poch about him once, and Poch saying he's just got to learn to live with the pain. He's essentially got a, a chronic ankle injury, that's, a chronic ankle problem that's always going to give him a bit of pain. So I don't know whether that's the same thing or not. Um, but yeah, obviously he needs to get fit because he needs that loan to kind of kick on and start going. A little bit similar with Sergio Reguilon. He's at Atletico Madrid, um, waiting to make his debut for the club. Um, I think when he signed, they expected him to be out until October. He had a groin injury. So uh, maybe after this international break, we'll see Reglon playing for Atletico Madrid. Because this thing, Spurs want these guys to play as well because they want them to be racking up interest, whether it be at the clubs they're at or whether it's at other clubs um, elsewhere. And, you know, and Giovanni Lacelso is a good example of that. He has been playing. Um, getting plenty of minutes, um, played seven times for Villarreal, scored once against Elche, uh, El- Elche, Elche. Um, on Sunday, funnily enough, he was a sub for the first time in the Liga since he went back, uh, playing 31 minutes as they drew 1-1 at home with Sevilla. Sevilla. My pronunciation today, honestly, it's bad enough at the best of times, it's just gone down a cliff today. Um, Troy Parrott, went back at home rather than abroad, Troy Parrott, Preston, Tough one for Troy because Preston are really struggling for goals at the moment. Obviously, he is one of those strikers, but they're just struggling kind of to create chances. And uh, I've got their figures here. They've scored. This is Preston have only scored three goals in their first ten league matches this season. 
Obviously, it's not helped him in his confidence. Started quite well, did Troy there. Um, and they really do believe in him. He started all 10 of those matches. But now, yeah, it's just a case of... Um, he's, I think he scored two... Yeah, he scored in one. He's played two Carabao Cups. So he's started, played in 12 matches, scored in one of the Carabao Cup ones against Huddersfield, I think it was. Um, Preston lost 2-0 at home against Sheffield United on Saturday. And yeah, I was looking at... I always like to look at the local papers to see what they're saying about the players. And Lancashire Live gave him a, a five. Um, it said he was busy in attack again and tried to try dropped in to try and link things up. Set up one chance for a teammate, but didn't look overly dangerous in the final third. One deflected shot aside. Looks a little bit confident shot in front of goal. That's it. He's a young guy. So maybe he goes away with Ireland and uh, and that boosts his confidence again and he comes back ready for it. One guy who's not lacking for confidence right now is Dane Scarlett at Portsmouth. He's having a cracking loan. Um, four goals scored, one assist in his 12 matches. Uh, for the League One outfit who are flying high. Uh, just looking at his stats here as well. 70 minutes as Portsmouth drew 2-2 with Plymouth. Um, it's become very, very popular there already, not only among the fans, but among his teammates. Danny Cowley, who I think I've said before, I know from back in the day, uh, covering non-league and Braintree Town, uh, where he was the manager. He's I think I saw one quote from him recently. He said he's privileged to work with Dane just because he's become going to become such a star. Um, and obviously, Dane's now gone off with the under twenties at England level. So, uh, yeah, going well for Dane. So that's a good one. Someone who didn't have a very uh, good week was Alfie Whiteman. Unfortunately, he took a nasty whack to the head. He's out in Sweet, uh, Sweden, Sweden with Degafors. Um, took a nasty whack to the head, which I think is only eight minutes into their game. One-one draw against AIK. Um, yeah, he took a whack, and I think they're saying after the coach that it looks like he's got concussion as well. So, not good for him. But um, yeah, he's kind of made a home for himself pretty much there. He was there last season, and now he's here for this season as well. And they're a club that you know, last couple of seasons have sat down there near the bottom of the table. We helped them stay up last year. Um, and yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens. Whether he ends up staying out there or, or goes elsewhere, but he certainly seems to. Uh, Essentially seems to be settled there. But yeah, obviously a nasty whack this side and hopefully he's feeling okay soon. Um, right, let's get to these Q&A, these questions, what we got. Um, ooh, loads of questions. Right, okay. Um, Richard Pugh asks, uh, unfortunately I can't, I'm doing these in latest order. There doesn't seem to be a way of doing these in another order. No, there's not. Uh, so apologies for those who got in there first. You're kind of being penalised. But hopefully I'll try and get those in the next video if I don't fit them in on this one. Richard Pugh asks, with Skriniar's contract coming up and talks appearing not to be going well at Inter, is there a talk that we will offer him a contract in January? If so, will we still go for a left-footed centre-back after? Yeah, it'd be interesting one, that. Skriniar was very much one that Mourinho was looking at. Um, didn't seem to be as much of a player far up the list of, of defenders last summer. Um, but he's a good player. He's a good player. I think when you're looking at money being saved as well and being able to put it to other positions, you'd you'd be surprised if they didn't. Um, but certainly I haven't heard any talk about him and Spurs recently. But yeah, financially it does make sense. Uh, Nick Gale asked, when will we see a video from Orlando? When I can, when I get some spare time, I am going to sort it out. It's all, all the videos are sitting there on my phone to kind of cobble together into one. So I will do it for those that um, are uh, going to watch that. Um, Russell Emerson asks for your Q&A have you any journalist heroes or writers you admire or dare I say it base your writing style on cheers Russ I don't base my style on anyone it's just me <laughs> it's just, just what I do um, in terms of journalists inspire me certainly um, she interviewed me wonderful lady a um, couple of times Julie Welch she is incredible Honestly, um, Google Julie Welch, if you're a massive Spurs fan, um, written the, um, oh my goodness, what's the name of it? It's like the biography, essentially. I want to get the name right. I wonder if I've got it here anywhere. It's essentially the book of Tottenham Hotspur. I'm going, you know what? It's not very professional, but I really want to make sure I get it right because she actually interviewed me for it and I've read it as well. It's fantastic. 
and I even plugged it, I think. The biography of Tottenham. It was, yeah. Did I say that? I can't remember now. Tottenham Hotspur, the biography. Um, it's it's really good, and that's not just because there's a chapter um, that's called Alistair's Day Off in it. Um, she's absolutely inspirational. Um, as a female journalist, you know, she was an absolute trendsetter. Um, yeah, honestly, look her up, and she's the loveliest lady. I've been so fortunate enough to chat with her a couple of times. Um, yeah, in terms of someone I really admire, definitely Julie will be there. Um, she's brilliant. Um, in terms of those I kind of see on a regular basis out and about, um, it's a tough one, really. I think everyone just kind of does their own thing. Obviously, Henry Winter is one of the uh, kind of the legends of of journalism. Um, see him out and about. He's a very nice guy as well. Obviously, he's very good at what he does. Um, he used to really like Paul Jiggins from The Sun in a completely different kind of sphere. Um, he was fantastic at what he did as well and finding angles and asking the right questions. Obviously, sadly, no longer with us. Um, yeah, that's it. I wouldn't say my heroes were probably in the journalism field. I wouldn't say. Um, what else we got? Uh, Sean Slater asks, do you believe Conte has a kind of Fergie effect at the club as he can run it in his way instead of just like a normal head coach? I have a feeling this could be the club he puts down roots and enjoys building something that will be his way to success instead of inheriting success like in the past for him. We'll see. He's definitely a dominant character behind the scenes. Of course he is. He's a very demanding man, um, and that's because he wants the very best. Um, obviously, we've seen all the Juventus links again uh, this week. Conte's going to get linked here and there and everywhere. He will not um, slap down those links. Of course he won't. He wants to keep the pressure on Tottenham and what they do. Um, the Juventus links are fascinating because... From what I understand, I think Pavel Nedved has always been desperate to have him back at Juventus. But I think there was a massive falling out with Agnelli, the um, the president owner chap, um, because I think it goes all the way back to when, was it 2013-14, when Conte walked out on them a day into pre-season um, because he wasn't happy with... That was the infamous a little while back talking about going into a hundred euro restaurant with 10 euros in his pocket or something like that. Um, often you'll find that Chelsea aside, often Conte leaves because financially the club aren't backing him. Um, yeah, that was a very, uh, that, that didn't end well their relationship then. And I think it kind of rumbled on a while. I remember there was something last season about, how do I put this in a polite way? Conte making a gesture towards the uh, stands where Agnelli was, or that was what they reckoned he was, and then the um, Juventus um, hierarchy man. Uh, hierarchy man? That's a weird one. Juventus, I want to get... I don't know if it's a CEO president in, in Italy. There's, they kind of hold about a million different titles sometimes. Apparently he, yeah, swore back at him. This is all just Italian reports. I don't know whether it was the case or not. I didn't watch the game. I've seen the footage of what looks like Conte... Um, how should we say raising his middle finger um, in the um, in the direction of Agnelli? Um, so yeah, I don't think Agnelli would be in a rush to bring him back on a personal level. Um, and ultimately, you know, Conte's got a contract to the end of the season. Whatever. Uh, there is also that option, which appears to be an option if both sides agree to extend. Um, yeah, I don't know. Some people are suggesting, is it one that Conte's got? Some saying, is it one the club got? I, th I feel like, from the bits and pieces I've heard, it's a mutual thing. Um, but yeah, no 100% confirmation on that. But I think that's the case. It's both sides. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's Daniel Levy. Juventus aren't going to come in, I don't think, and be able to just offer, you know, uh, sorry, just take Conte away if that were to be the case. If Sonny Agnelli just decided to put all past grievances aside. Um, I think Tottenham, it all still is in their court. If they show that they're backing Conte, and Conte feels that he can win stuff, Conte will look to stay. It's exactly what happened last summer, um, as well as the absence of, I guess, um, suitable jobs for him to go into. But yeah, I, um, I do think that will be... Yeah, in Spurs lane, really. They've just got to keep on progressing. And Conte has made it clear that this is a multi-transfer window thing. 
um, in January as well that I think, let's be honest, Brian Hill is likely to head off in January on loan. They, they, they can't keep him there just not playing. It's just daft. It's kind of a depreciation of their own asset as well if he's not playing. So you'd imagine just by naturally him going out, you have to bring in someone um, and then maybe you look at one or two. So I think they keep improving and next summer the same again. Um, and yeah, it's just Conte believing that he can win. Um, although I do find it interesting that you know, you've know you got Poch and Tuchel out there right now. Uh, two you know, very good managers, especially Pochettino knows Spurs inside out. Tuchel's got obviously a very good CV as well. Um, yeah, I'm intrigued to see what happens if it does kick off with Conte at any point. Because I think Conte would have to make things very... How do I put it? He'd have to really, really, really kick off, I think, for Spurs to even think it would be more or less trouble just to let him go. Because he's an amazing coach. You know, he's one of the best in the world. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Let, let's see. Let's see. I, I would say the events of stuff will probably rumble in the background like PSG did um, until, let's say, Juventus get someone else. I can't see Conte leaving mid-season anyway. Um, and then, you know, this, this extra year ex extension, I was told that when or if and when that happens, Spurs will announce that. It will be a big thing. They will make a thing out of it. Um, and who knows, you know, maybe they look to do a, a, a bigger contract. I don't know. He's brought Champions League back. Um, again, I'm not saying that's something I know is going to happen. Um, just wondering to myself whether... Look, I asked Conte about his contract out in um, Israel. Yeah, it was Israel. And he was just very blunt. He was just like, I don't really care about contracts. It's like, without being, I guess he was trying to say, without being that guy, he's earned a lot of money. So the money side of it for him personally is not such a big deal. He said almost it's a more of a burden for the club because he is a well-paid coach. Uh, so he's not that fussed about kind of long-term contracts and things like that. But um, I just wonder with Spurs whether they might get to a point where they just think, let's kind of lock him down. Um, again, he's got to agree to it. But in terms of financial commitment and a big payoff, if, if it all went wrong, I don't know. I think it makes sense myself. But yeah, like I say, events and stuff will rumble on because obviously Allegri, uh, it's not going his way right now. Um and I'm sure the Italian media will constantly link Conte with a return to Juventus because it is, it makes sense, I guess, apart from that, um, yeah, apart from that uh, problems in the past with the Juventus hierarchy and um, Agnelli in particular. But yeah, yeah, honestly, you, you know my thoughts on Conte. Um, he will have his emotional outbursts. He will want to probably leave a million times at every club he's been at um, and Tottenham will be no different it's just a guess about him feeling things are going in the right direction um, and that he's the Premier League's a difficult one isn't it I mean he said this enough times you've to win the Premier League I mean you look at it now and you look at Man City and how good they were and then they've shoved Haaland up front and it's just, you can see how difficult it is to kind of overtake them and, and win that league. And, you know, you look at Liverpool maybe not having the same season as they did last year. I mean, he, even with City, I guess you could look at, was it Villa and West Ham have, have held them to draw? So it's possible, but it's so difficult, I think, to win the Premier League now, to break that stranglehold of probably City and, and Liverpool to a degree, maybe not so much this year. We'll see. They may turn it all around. Um, if I'm Conte, I'm looking at that and thinking, maybe second or third are up for grabs this season if we can continue this kind of direction we're in. But I guess for Conte, it's not really enough. He wants the then, the after, the something tangible. Um, but then it would be down to him, I guess, to win cup competitions, um, especially in Europe. You know, it's not really his forte. So, uh, yeah, let's see. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a question about essentially content, whether he's a bit like Fergie effect. But yes, in essence, yes, I think he will have a bigger impact on Tottenham. Although I would say Poch really changed a lot of what Spurs were about. So he had a very big impact on the club. I think with Conte, you do have Paratici. So Paratici is going to have a big impact as well. Um DB29011. 
Uh, Ars, do you think we'll see another 30-goal season from Harry Kane in the Premier League? Well, six and six so far. He very much could do. He gets a few hat-tricks in there as well. He hasn't scored a hat-trick in a while. Um, definitely is banging the goals in. I wouldn't say he's really hit his kind of, um, kind of full... Uh, God, what's the word? Hit his stride. He hasn't hit his stride yet. Um, but he's still scoring. So if he hits his stride, goodness knows how many goals are going to go in. So uh, just keeping clear of injury, I guess. I think we will see another 30-goal season from him, definitely. Um, JND's fishing asks, can you let us know what's happening with Jed Spence? He seems like a forgotten man, or Conte does not want to involve him. Such a shame if that's the case. Just the case that he's at the moment third in line for the right wing-back slot. That's that's all it is, really. He's a young player. Um, Conte wants him to, I guess, understand everything he's asking of him. Wants him to be fitness-wise right up there because of the wing-back role. He'll get his chances. He will. Whether it is just in, to begin with in the Carabao Cup against Forest, or, or there will be God, how many is, 13 matches after this international break between... Uh, October the 1st and the, with the day they head off to kind of start preparing for the World Cup and the, the season comes to a, a rubbish pause. Um, and in that time, we've got a game every three to four days. There will be injuries. I think Jed Spence will probably end up playing one of those Premier League games as well. Um, and it's just down to him then. Take the chance. You know, if, if Conte is, and I'm not saying he is, but if he were to be being stubborn, and just deciding this is a player who the club won, but I don't really believe he's ready yet, then show him otherwise. That's the only way you can change people's minds. Um, Wayne Lloyd, stadium naming rights. Haven't heard anything recently, but to be fair, I haven't been digging into that recently. Um, I know we, Todd Klein, we were speaking to him out in... South Korea on the tour and he was talking about the process of that and how the pandemic essentially closed down a lot of the ability to do that deal uh, really because or in essence you weren't able to show off the stadium as it really can be so obviously you've got coming up next month you've got the NFL games are back as well and maybe this season is the better one to showcase it and I guess get the maximum value for your stadium naming rights um, Sam Salinas asks, can we talk about Moussa Dembele? I wonder if Spurs will ever see another figure like him in the team. He was pretty special. I've always said that about Moussa. If he had anything about him in the final third, he would have been seen as world class, I think, um, because the rest of his game was so good. And it's kind of unfair because there are a lot of other players out there like uh, Kante, Kante that doesn't have an attacking side to the game, but they are seen as one of the best in their position. I guess Makaleli was the same as well. But with Moussa Dembele, I don't know, there was almost this feeling that he wasn't quite in that same category. And, and you know, anyone you talk to that's played with him has said, will say he's the best player they've played with. Um, Braden Major asks, thoughts on the MLS? You mean thoughts on the MLS? I'm not allowed to say the... Um, I never used to use the, and I used it in one article or a tweet. I said the MLS because technically you're saying the Major League Soccer, which doesn't make any sense. You know, so it's thoughts on. And someone quite rightly, and I think it was an American journalist, picked me up on it. Um, so yeah, sorry. So I'm doing exactly the same, being pedantic there. Um, thoughts on the MLS? Thoughts on the MLS? What could be better? What do you not like about it? That's if you've ever watched it. Thanks as ever, Ali. Um, yeah, no, I do watch it from time to time. Um, I don't always get the chance to. Um, I did, actually. There was a part of me that wondered what it would be like. I think I said this before, of maybe going out and covering a new team. You know, when Beckham was starting up into Miami with his fellow founders, I did. There was a part of me that thought, I wonder what that would be like to go out and cover a brand new team from scratch in um, uh, in that kind of format in MLS. And... Obviously, it never came to be. It was not something I really explored, and I don't think it would be difficult to leave uh, the Tottenham beat, as it were, because it's crazy and there's always something happening. Um, MLS is definitely on the up. It is. Um, I think they're going in the right direction. Yes, you've got the likes of Bale and Cellini going to LAFC and stuff like that. I actually watched the El Trafico. I went to the LA Derby uh, when Spurs were doing the 
um, American Tours 2018. I think I went and saw that. Uh, it was very cool. I think maybe it'll start to get away eventually when it gets away from, I guess, European stars going there in their twilight years and becomes more of a breeding ground for just what it is, which is, you know, it's got some good, talented players. We've seen them come over to the Premier League as well. I think that's obviously when it'll take the next step. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely a very a much an improving league. Um, what else we got? Josh Goodhead asks, hey, G-Man. I don't know if I've been called G-Man before. Um, who could you see as a worthy replacement to Lloris down the line? Stephen, I saw an interesting report this week. One of the French journalists was claiming that if Poch were to take over at Nice, then he would get Lloris um, to come to Nice. Um, so, yeah, I found that one quite um, an interesting one. Um, obviously, he's got a deal to 2024. So I don't know whether that would be the case. Obviously, he's nice born, isn't he, Larice? I'm just trying to see. He did play for him, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Of course he did. He started off there um, in his kind of top flight career. So I kind of get the logic behind that. And I think he has said he'd like to go back to France one day. It'd just be interesting to see whether Poch would go to Nice. Um, but you never know. Uh, in terms of successor, I think it'll be someone we haven't thought of at this point. Um, that's my thinking behind that. Uh, I don't think it will be one of the obvious ones that are out there right now. I think Spurs will try to identify someone that becomes the long-term um, uh, player for the uh, for the spot. Obviously, Fraser Forster's coming. He's not going to be the long-term guy. Yeah, I just feel it will be it'll be someone else, um, someone else that we haven't probably spoken about much. It's the name that was someone who was at Milan. Who was it? Really long name, surname chap that's gone out of my head was definitely someone they were looking at. No, it's completely gone out of my head. Again, whack it in the comments. I think I wrote about it. Um, let's just see if I've got it here. So, this is the beauty, or not so much, of doing um, these Q and A's kind of without looking at the questions first to try and give you guys a, a sense that I'm doing this. Well, as I am live, no edits or anything. Um, but also, you know, it does mean that there's certain things that I'm not going to be too aware of. I'm just seeing here whether this was a piece. Because I was no, I can't find it. I can't find it. It'll be, it'll be in. It might pop into my brain before the end of this. Um, and if not, I'm sure you'll tell me. I think it began with an M and ended in Ellie. It was a long name, like a Georgian kind of name. Oh, well, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Um, next one. Kevin Jackson asks, what ha what's happened to Pape uh, Matasar? He's there. He's there. He's a young player. Um, learning away. Uh, Conte gave him a bit of praise about how he'd been working so hard and, and he could see improvement in him and he's a talented young one for the future. Um, he'll be one, like I say, a bit like... I was going to say like, a bit like Brian Hill, but that's probably not fair. Well, to a degree. He's a bit younger, isn't he? Um, he might get the odd moment, maybe in the Carabao Cup, things like that. Um, he's been on the bench a couple of times so far. I'd imagine you settling him in for this first six months and then in January look for a loan for him. That makes most sense to me. Um, yeah, it does really. Um, I, I, yeah. He's a guy that's very much one for the future. He he even more so than Jed Spence for me. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't worry too much about him. That's a packed area, that midfield as well. That is um, an area where you're um, you're going to see a lot of competition, and especially if he goes to a three as well, because, um, yeah, there's quite a few there. Shaka Hislop. There's... Um, Someone linking, uh, that was quite funny. So I typed in goalkeepers and Shaka Hislop came up. I can't remember who it is that's going to bug me now for the rest of this video. Um, I feel like it was a Milan goalkeeper. Again, you're probably all saying that it's this person, you mop it, and it'll be all underneath. Um, but it's fine, it's fine. We'll work it out at a later date because um, I'm wasting time. So, what else we got here? We got um, Simon McCarran asks. I have two questions for the Q&A. 
All right, we'll, we'll try it. We'll see if we can fit him in. Uh, do you think football managers are ever influenced by journalists like yourself when they speak to them at press conferences? You could plant a seed or suggest something maybe they hadn't thought of, for example, changing a formation for a particular match or playing someone in a different role. Um, no, probably not. I'd love to think that I'd have that ability to change someone's mind. Um, and I guess if if I did ever suggest something that maybe they hadn't thought of which is so unlikely it's incredible i don't think they'd ever say that that was the case um yeah i'm trying to think is it i mean no i don't think so i don't think i think maybe the only way that that could change something is if they were to be able to gauge from a question that there was a public perception about something whether a player people wanted to see a player get a chance or a player they didn't like or something and maybe they felt that that would be a bit of a crowd-pleasing thing to do especially if they were under fire that's about the only thing I could think of but even that's a stretch um, second question was also are you aware of anyone at Tottenham who follows you on Twitter or watches your videos if they don't they should um, yeah I've I know there's, yeah, well, there's a certain few, fair few people at Spurs, I think, follow me on Twitter. I think. I know the press officers keep an eye in case I say anything they think I shouldn't. Um, which, yeah. Yeah, sometimes they have, it's not burner accounts, but it's accounts that they don't really, various staff members don't use, uh, other than lurking, I guess, and spying. Um, and I know a couple of them watch the odd video, but, um, yeah, not not to the degree of it really meaning anything. Probably just watching to see if I say anything um, naughty. Um, what else we got here? We've got is it uh, Juan Hernandez says is it crazy to consider Richarlison as a right wing back? He would have a, seem to have better pace and engine to get up and down the side of the pitch than Decky. I probably wouldn't play him there. I think Richard, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, Kulusevsky is actually the way he dribbles up a pitch and gets up and down that flank. I think he is actually quite suited for a right wing back role. But uh, Richarlison, no, I'd probably play him further up there as a more of a battling kind of t um, attacking player. Um, what else we got? Da -da -da -da. That was about my daughter going off to uni. Cody Yeoman asks, what do you think about players like Lucas Moore publicly giving his political views on a podcast or on Twitter? Does it cause any friction or problems in the dressing room? Great video as always. I'd imagine it doesn't. I can't imagine his beliefs on stuff back in Brazil probably create a big issue in the um, Spurs dressing room. I wouldn't have thought so, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I'd probably say no to that. I can't imagine it would. Um, Mark Trower asked, we asked about Jed Spence, but we've answered that. And also asked, are you going to cover the World Cup in Qatar? Um, flying out there, I mean. No, no, I'm not. No, we. my role, we don't really kind of cover international football um so no no i'll just be i'll be watching on with interest um seeing how all the spurs players do and obviously enjoying the games i don't like it being in the winter i don't i don't like the season being split in half i think it's all a complete and utter mess if i'm honest um but hey it'll still be the world cup and hopefully it'll be good some good matches i just hope it doesn't detract from the quality of the second half of the season really um Anthony Gonzalez asks, which teams do you think will come fourth, third, second and first at the end of the season? I think City will win it. I do. I think Spurs really, especially if you consider that they haven't really been playing too amazingly and yet they're unbeaten and they're a point off the top, I think they will believe that if they can now start to put a run together, they can definitely be up there. I'm not saying they're going to win it. But definitely they'll look at Liverpool maybe having a little bit of a kind of a different season to last one. They'll look at Chelsea and the um, changes going on there. You look at Arsenal who, you know, obviously looked improved this season but will have more tests to come. Obviously they've got 
I think North London Derby and then Liverpool straight after, I think. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a one two. Um and obviously Man U improving in recent weeks, but will they be able to sustain that? If I'm Spurs and Conte, I'm looking at and thinking there's a chance to at least aim for second or third and keep improving on last season. Um, it's a purely a prediction. I'd say first City. I'm going to put my neck on the line and say second Tottenham. Third Liverpool. Fourth, I think maybe Arsenal. I think Arsenal might get that. Um, yeah, maybe Spurs and Liverpool could be either way. Um, that, that's what I'll go for. It could all go completely wrong. And Conte could um, have an emotional moment. Spurs could implode and they could finish out some top four. But that's top Um <laughs> I don't even notice that. James Ridder asked, do you think anyone will have the courage to tell Conte he keeps saying front up in press conference instead of up front when referring to his forwards? Do you know what? I haven't noticed that. Maybe it's something I automatically correct when I'm doing the transcripts, um, but I wasn't aware of that. If anything, it's not really up to us. It would be um, his press officer would probably mention that to him if he kept using it. Um, Christopher Beavis asked, during World Cup 2022, will you be going over there to cover anything like it was asked before? Will you be waiting patiently like the rest of us to get back to Prem? Very much the latter. Um, what else we got? Siddharth. Siddharth Shah asks, who do you think realistically finishes high between North London clubs? I do think it'll be Spurs. I do think Arsenal are going to have an improved season. Like I said, I think they probably will make the top four. But I just think maybe Spurs' squad depth is slightly more. Um, they could probably handle a couple more injuries that maybe Arsenal can't. And what else we got? <laughs> the review guy. Personal questions. Fully appreciate if you don't want to answer, but I was intrigued to know a little bit more about you. Like, how long have you been married? Did you meet your wife through work or different? Is your daughter your only child? And where did you grow up, live now? Uh, so, been married a long time now. 19, almost. That is 19 years now. Um, God, 19 years. Uh, met at Tesco's, where we both worked many, 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 many years ago. Um... And grew up, live now, grew up in Loughton, um, was where I first grew up, and in North Weald, which was very cool. Lots of fields near the old uh, World War Two airfield as well. Uh, and now we're kind of over Stansted Airport kind of way. It's where we live now. Um, kids, you, you'll have heard me speak about my daughters in the past as well. Um, Nick Fenn asks if both strikers play at their respective clubs for the same time who will break more records Haaland or Kane um, oh, it's a tough one isn't it I was talking about this with someone earlier I just could only I didn't want to imagine it but I was what Kane would have been like in that City team I think he probably would have scored just as many goals. I do, because the amount of chances being created for him. But don't get me wrong, Haaland's utterly class. Um, yeah, I don't know. Kane could get the Shearer's record, and then maybe Haaland, if he sticks around that long and steers clear of injuries, maybe he attempts to break it later down the line. I don't know. But um, both quality, quality players. Um, Komar asks Komar, oh yeah I've got to be careful of these someone asked, someone put in their name a question and, and I didn't even think about it and I read out and it was um, one of those that uh, I think it was a, a Drew something uh, which I didn't didn't think and it was like the oldest trick in the book and I felt it um, he asked, that's all and nice with regards to rotation of Son, Kusevsky, Ritchie. What about Kane? When is his turn? Does he ever get rotated? Yeah, he will. Well, Conte said in these 13 games coming up, he's going to have to. Otherwise, he risks him getting injured. And of course, on an international level, you know, Kane is not going to want to be injured for that World Cup. Um, so, yeah, he will. And I think Richarlison will probably take on that lone striker role. Um, you'd imagine at least one, maybe two games. Something like, obviously, the Carabao Cup. You'd think Kane wouldn't start that one as well. Um, and potentially a Premier League game as well. 
what else we got? Um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Lewis Moreau says, because I said in my last video it was a really nice hit, the Madison goal. Um, and he's saying he's pretty sure it came off his knee. If anything, it was a bit of a fluke. Watching it back, I agree. It wasn't his knee. It was kind of his shin. But, um, yeah, I thought it was really good at the time. But I saw a proper close-up view of it, and it was. It was... Um, Came off his shin a bit. It's still, I still think it's a good goal. It's a bit like Wayne Rooney scoring that overhead kick in the Manchester derby. I, at the time, was saying, oh, but it's still off his shin and everyone was raving about it. But actually, it doesn't really detract from the quality of the goal. And I'd say with Madison's, there's an element of a little bit of fluke to it, of course. But I think his movement was still good. Um, Penguin Lord Sauron. Nice old mix there of Lord of the Rings. Um, hi, Ali. You're closing in on 50,000 subscribers. Congrats. Any thoughts for a 50,000 subscriber special? I'd love to hear something like a collection of anecdotes or a my favourite stories from my career, etc. Yeah, maybe I will. Maybe I will. Yeah, I've never. that's the thing, the subscribers thing. I've never really focused on that. I mean, you'd never hear me asking for people to, to do that. Um, it's not really something that I'm that fussed about. Um, but yeah, maybe, yeah, if, if it does reach that landmark, I guess, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll try and do some little special, maybe I'll do like a live thing, not that these aren't live anyway, um, in a, in a sense, because I don't edit them, I just chuck them on, which sometimes is very, very obvious, um, yeah, no, I'll do something like that if, if it gets there, uh, what else we got? Uh, Graham Lindsay asks, is the absence of Mora linked in any way to his interview he did? No, I don't think so. Um, what did he call it? Something to do with his tendon. Problem with his tendon uh, in his calf, I think it is. Uh, yeah, so no, no. It seems to be an injury from everything I'm aware of. Uh, what else we got? Yeah, I've heard this one. I don't know whether it's a thing in Korea. Or I don't know what it is. Um, Jun B asks, I have a serious question. What do you make of the argument that Perisic has been negatively affecting Son's performance this season? Uh, come to think of it, most, if not all, of Son's brightest moments this season was Perisic was, was, wasn't on the pitch. Southampton, Fulham and now Leicester. It doesn't strike me as a mere coincidence, really. It's an interesting thing. I must admit, it's not something that ever crossed my mind before. Um, I'm trying to imagine why that would be the case, though, in terms of why that would be a negative for him being on the pitch. I guess maybe maybe Perisic being a good cross of the ball. Maybe he's getting the ball in better to those on the right-hand side. Whereas maybe Sessegnon would play the ball off to Son a little bit more as the younger one of the two. Perhaps that's one. Uh, be honest, I think it's just that this, this Sonny has been a bit off the boil. That's all it is. And, and obviously, hopefully, after coming alive with those incredible goals um, against Leicester... You know, Perisic is world class in that position. Son, for me, is world class in his position. Two world class players will be able to operate together absolutely fine. I wouldn't worry about that. I think it is just a a strange quirk of what's happened right now. Um, you know, it's not like Sonny scored in those games that Perisic wasn't there or or got an assist even, other than the Southampton game. Um, so yeah, we'll see. I need a bit of a bigger sample size. I think that's that's the way I'd put it. Uh, whether it actually becomes a thing or not. Um, what else we got? What do, 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 do? Emeka McQuaid asks, what would be your starting lineup for the North London derby? I think I said that. Did I not say that in the last one? I can't remember now. Um, I would go for uh, Laurie Singal. Hopefully he's fit. I forgot to say that at the start. Obviously he picked up a small thigh injury, um, which... He reported with at French camp. Um, Spurs being very tight-lipped on it, which you would be before a North London derby. It's not to say that that suggests it's a bad thing, as in it's like a bad injury. It may be the case that they just want to have that little bit of mystery around their team lineup ahead of it, especially the captain. Uh, hopefully he will be fit because I would go with Lloris, uh, Romero, Dyer. Personally, I probably would have gone with the experience of Davies, but whether he is fit enough in time for that, he obviously had um, that uh, little hairline fracture underneath his knee. He's meant to be roughly three weeks, so it should be just about in time, you'd think. 
if he's if there's any question of him not being fully fit, of course you go with Longley. Personally, I think experience wise, you go for um, Davies for me and that. I know not everyone will agree. Then I would go for a five. I would go. I'd go three five two. So I go with Basuma with um, Hoybier and Benton Kerr. I would go with wing backs of Perisic and Kulusevski. Um, I think I know people would say, oh, Emerson needs to be the to defender needs to be the wing back. But I think if you've got three in the middle there with one able to drop back and split back four, you can get away with a more attacking wing back, and that gets Kulusevski in the team, and then Kane and Son up front. That's what I'd go for. Um, what else we got? Jamie Fisher, have you seen a new Elvis biopic? If so, what are your thoughts? I haven't yet. I do really want to watch it, um, but I haven't had the chance. We almost went to the cinema to see it, and I didn't in the end. I watched oh, I just some really good films on the flight when I went to Orlando. I had see, Everything Everywhere All at Once. That's brilliant. Absolutely chaotic, but brilliant. Um, and King Richard I watched as well, which is very good. It just kind of makes the whole Will Smith at the Oscars thing all the more kind of an, uh, just uh, frustrating, no doubt for Chris Rock being slapped in the face, but more the fact that he's really good in King Richard and he just not only ruined, I think it was Questlove, wasn't it, coming on next to get his Oscar. He just kind of ruined that moment. I think he ruined a lot of the maybe good feelings towards that film as well because it's a good film, King Richard, and he's very, very good in it, Will Smith. He probably was Oscar-worthy, uh, but yeah, just a shame it kind of got sullied with that silly moment. Um, what else we got? Sam asks, how much social network channels do you garner the feedback from other fans, or do you use to garner the feedback from other fans? Do you use anything other than Twitter, e.g. Reddit, Spurs fan site, community soccer forums, etc.? I don't use really forums anymore. Used to, way back in the day. Used to go on Spurs community from the lane way back in the day. Um, Reddit, I do look at occasionally. Um, I did a really enjoyable Q&A on there. Really enjoyed myself. That was good fun. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, the Spurs Reddit is it's a funny place. It's, I like the sense of humour in there. So whenever I do take a little look in there... Um, it's quite amusing. I do like it. It seems to be, um, I don't know, Twitter. Twitter is an interesting mix. There's a lot of good things on Twitter, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of, how do I put this? I suppose unpleasant people on there. Um, so yeah, sometimes I like to look elsewhere. Um, I, I wouldn't use, I wouldn't say I use it to any degree other than it's interesting sometimes to see what the general theme is towards a player or something like that. It definitely doesn't guide me, as you can probably tell with my player ratings, because people get very annoyed by them. I wouldn't rate someone based on what people think about them. Um, they would only be rated on their performance. And I would say, I think I've said this before, when I do player ratings, I just do not really look at Twitter. It's just, and it sounds really blunt and awful to say, but I don't care what the reaction is, because player ratings are very much subjective it's my view on something it's my player ratings i could you know look at the replies underneath and i think on the odd occasion i have actually looked or i've been looking for something else and i couldn't get away from my notifications because they do flash up on my phone like crazy times um essentially i've got one person who's telling me hoibier you've marked him too low he was rubbish and the next person told me you marked hoibier too um too, sorry, you marked him too high, he's rubbish, or you've marked him too low, he was fantastic. And it's like, you can get within the space about four or five tweets, you can get about three or four different, completely different views, and that's the point. It's subjective. Um, so that's why I always find it bizarre when some people get very angry, like, you know, you're a Muppet, how have you given this? And like get really angry, and it's like, well, we see things in different ways. And I do think also sometimes seeing it in a stadium is a little bit different to watching on a telly. Get maybe a more all-round view. You can watch things they're doing off the ball that you can't see on the telly, perhaps as well. Um, but yeah, so now I don't really use it to, um, yeah, not for feedback or anything like that. Occasionally, I'll look at see. I think yeah, actually, one positive thing I do think I'll look at various stuff is to see what people are asking about, uh, and if there's something that I can go out there and write an article about to help people understand something or they want to know about a situation you know i guess 
It's like a, kind of like a huge Q and A, I guess it is, uh, using it in that respect. Um, Michael McCarthy says, "Did you go on Rise of the Resistance in Orlando? Any good? Yes, very enjoyable. Although I actually thought there's one moment we're in the queue, and I thought that was the ride, and I was quite disappointed until I realised it was just part of the um, queuing experience." Um, Daniel Jacks asks if you could have a sit down interview with three people at the same time from Tottenham and it could be former or current owners, players, coaches or managers who would those three be you've got to shove Levy in there you've got to shove Daniel Levy in there because he does so few interviews uh, I think he has to be in there um, if I'm doing current I'd go for well actually I'd, I'd like to go Levy, Conte and Paratici I'd love to see the dynamic and how that all works and quiz them about certain things um, in terms of players obviously back in the day Gaza would have been a fantastic interview maybe you've done Gaza, Lineker and maybe Terry Venables back in the day I think as a three that would have been really good as well um, my heroes when I was young Lineker was one and Sheringham and Klinsman later on were as well. So maybe Sheringham, Klinsman and... I would say Martin Joel, but I've spoken to Martin Joel so much. Um, done a lot of stuff with Martin Joel. And I'd shove him in there as well because he's great. Martin Joel's a great, great guy to have a chat with. Um, what else we got? I'll do another couple because I just realised I've gone past the hour mark. Uh, da, 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 da. Charlie Delta asks, "What's with GL, uh, Giovanni Lo Celso's break clause in January? Seems a bit weird. Are the club confident of selling him in January? Maybe Villarreal will have the money in January to make it permanent." Um, I don't know if it's weird. I think it's just one of those where they didn't. He was one that I think probably they felt they could have got some money for, um, but obviously he was quite insistent on going back to Villarreal, and they wanted him this way. You know, obviously he has to still agree to it. But if he has a good first half of the season, he is playing regularly, then yes, someone else can come in. Um, and hopefully Spurs can make a bit of money, which they can then put straight towards the January window, I guess, and any funds they've got for that. Um, so yeah, I get the logic behind it. If you have to loan him, it's not the worst thing in the world to be able to have a break clause. Because most, when you're in the academy, a lot of them have break clauses. But with the first team deals, not so many of them do. So I, I get it. I understand it. Um, what else we got? I think those we've all kind of asked. Answered even. I've had a couple of people ask me this about the potential rail strikes postponing the North London derby. I haven't really heard any more on that. Um, I know that was a little whisper that some people were saying on social media. I'd be surprised because I think it's overground rail strikes, isn't it? So, obviously, if that were the case, then tubes would still be up. So I don't know whether that would be a thing or not. I don't know. I'll be honest, I, I don't want to lead anyone in any direction. Uh, but I haven't heard anything to that effect at this point. Um, There you go. Right. I think I'll have to head off there because that's been quite a long one. Um, But, of course... Shove more questions if you want under this one. Uh, it doesn't have to be about football. You know what I might enjoy answering lots of questions. There's actually a lot of football questions that time. Normally it's a, it's a quite a mix of movies, personal questions, whatever. Um, by all means, get as many questions as you like under the next one. Um, we've got a whole international break to fill. I'll probably do another couple before the international break is done. Um, so I'll try and, and get through a load of these. But uh, yeah, I'm going to head off now. I've actually got to go and walk in deep. So I'm going to go and do that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to head off. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else to keep an eye on. Obviously, international games. I'll do any little updates on bits and pieces of note with the younger players as well in the days ahead. Uh, probably try and do a video maybe Saturday. We'll see how it goes. Because um, we'll have had a few international games then and I can answer more questions. Yeah, right. Going to head off. Uh, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.